Yeah. Well, hello. Uh, I am Philip Huddleston, it's projecting voice, teacher voice. Uh, welcome to the Six Bridges Book Festival. Thank you for coming out this afternoon. We have two incredible panelists to talk with us today. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to start out with some presentations of their work. We get to be the fun panel of pictures worth a thousand words, so we have more words than all the other authors. We, uh, we are going to have, start off with uh, Sophia Warren. Sophia Warren has been a contributing cartoonist at The New Yorker since 2017. Her work has been published in MoMA Magazine, Catapult, and Narrative Magazine, and the books Send Help and Notes from the Bathroom Line. Warren was born in Rhode Island and lives in Brooklyn. Her debut graphic memoir, Radical, My Year with a Socialist Senator, depicts her experience embedded within a first term, with a first term, uh, Senator Julia Salazar. So, Sophia Warren. Yeah, should I, uh, should I come Yeah, or however you'd like. Hello, thank you for coming. Thanks for letting me come to Arkansas for the first time. I've never been here. Um, so yeah, I'll just walk you through kind of the basics of this book and then we can ideally get to conversation soon. Um, so it's called Radical My Year with a Socialist Senator. This is about the year that I spent with Julia Salazar, who is uh, a state senator in New York. This was her first year in office. So she ran as a democratic socialist in North Brooklyn, which is where I was living at the time. Um, I was not particularly, that's a picture of, of Bushwick, which is where we first met. Um, I was not following state politics at this point, not a particularly involved political person. I was certainly reading headlines, but was not someone to whom this was a fascinating subject. Um, but her campaign was just very energetic in my neighborhood. It was sort of impossible to ignore. And uh, Julia, like me, was 27. We were both half Latina. We had a lot of things in common that made her feel very close to me in a way that I hadn't felt with other politicians up to that point. Um, and so she won this big upset victory. It was a pretty, you know, a local race. So considering the size of the race, it was pretty surprising how much energy and how much uh, she managed to upset this person that she was running against, a 12-term incumbent, at the, or sorry, 12-year incumbent at that point, a Democrat. So when she won, I reached out and I said, hello, I am a local cartoonist. I'm interested in following you around. Um, and it had been a pretty bruising campaign for her, just a lot of sort of mudslinging stuff. So I went into this expecting to have to do quite a lot of convincing. My intent was I was interested in following her around because uh, I just figured I would never make myself learn about politics unless I sort of attached it to something like a project and something that I like to do, like comics. Um, and the hope was that I could sort of serve as a translator of this process by making this book about it that's ideally more accessible than, say, a book that's all prose about the ins and outs of government. So that was the idea, but I was expecting to have to kind of convince this team to let me follow them around and maintain creative control, which is what happened. But they were completely on board, actually, from the beginning. I had no, really no friction um, and was able to just start embedding with this office. Um, and was granted pretty full access for the first year, which was very cool. Because Julia was coming from an organizing background, a lot of her office was structured around the principles of community organizing. Um, and the, the big legislative push for the year for her office and at large in the state of New York had to do with tenants' rights. And there was an incredibly organized community coalition of tenants' rights uh, organizers who were working towards this very strong bill of tenants' rights. So I also spent a lot of time with them. Uh, this is an early March that they had, sort of to build energy for the year. This is uh, Andrew Cuomo, who maybe you've heard of. He kind of rose to national fame. Um, 
over the pandemic, was briefly America's boyfriend, which I didn't like very much, but now he's been disgraced. Anyway, at the time, he was sort of the antagonist of this movement because he was a very bullying, very entrenched uh, centrist Democrat who sort of like did lip service to the tenants' rights movement, but then was actually doing these backroom deals with the Republicans and preventing bills from happening. Um, so not a lot of love for him. Um, but for me, it was a really fascinating experience because it meant I got this inside scoop on things like government. This is a, a spread of Empire Plaza, which is in Albany, the capital of New York. In my opinion, a shockingly ugly structure. Um, it looks very alien, so I, I couldn't resist doing a little bit of editorial on just the structure of it, which is so much of the experience of being there. This like brutalist kind of Soviet feeling space that you're in. Um, but it was sort of representative of this, the setup of this year, which was that these very scrappy young organizers came into this very entrenched and quite corrupt uh, system of government. New York was was rated the most corrupt state government in 2016. It had a ton of, there was a big uh, US attorney had done a lot of legislating in, in 2015 and, and ended up a lot of people going to jail on both sides. So um, it was quite a dramatic year for this office that had this mandate to try and stay accountable to this movement that they were a part of, to organizers, to their constituents, while, of course, they also had to try and you know, play politics and, and make this actually happen within Albany. Um, so there were, some, there were some real moments of tension. This is a scene where Boris, who was the chief of staff, uh, was put on administrative leave because he was being kind of too familiar and combative with uh, an assembly person who was a Democrat. Um, I also got this opportunity because this was a book that I intended to not, I didn't want to focus it exclusively on Julia, the senator. I wanted it to be about this movement that she was coming from um, and be kind of more representative of that element of the politics that she was running on. So it meant that as I was structuring the narrative, I got to kind of take a step back from just her experience as a legislator and also spend time with people like Ramon, who's pictured here, who is one of her staffers, an organizer in the office, um, and have some really meaningful conversations about organizing and the ways that citizens who aren't part of the government can interact with uh, people power and the government through collective action. Um, so that, for me, was a huge takeaway of this experience because I am not a politician, but I am a citizen, so definitely relevant to the life that I lead. Um, also got to spend time with these organizers. This is a scene from uh, later in the year when I went up to Albany with the tenants' rights organizers as they were lobbying uh, and plus having increasingly aggressive um, escalating actions, trying to get their bills passed. Um, this is a nice moment where you see their interaction with Julia's office, where the office was sort of open to them as their home base. As they were in Albany, they could leave their backpacks, they could charge their phones, um, stuff like that. Uh, this is a scene that is one of my favorites in the book because um, I feel really lucky that I was able to be part of moments like this one when things were not going very well and people were very stressed and they yelled at each other, there was a lot of tension. This was a, a low point in the push for their legislation, their sort of uh, key bill that they were pushing for the year. It was looking unlikely that it was going to pass. They had a lot of disagreements about strategy. People were very tired. It was a very tense moment. Um, coming right out of some big arguments in the, in the legislature at large about budget. Um, and I'm just grateful that it's in the book because uh, it was nice to be embedded in an office that sort of understood that this is part of the tapestry of you're showing a real picture of what it looks like to actually be a part of government. It includes moments like this one. Um, and then just a last spread. This is one of the organizers explaining this uh, phone call that she had with the governor, a uh, pretty intimidating phone call. Um, I won't give too much away, but it's not 
so much a secret, it's pretty public record, that most of this bill did end up passing, this package of bills about tenants' rights legislation. Um, so there was a lot to celebrate at the end of this, which was uh, pretty profound as far as the experience for tenants in New York. Um, but also, Julia's bill did not pass. It was one of the few bills in that package that didn't. So, um, it was a nice setup for me because it was a, a point of victory and things to celebrate, but also something really characteristic of uh, organizing work, which is that it's a long road and you have to regroup and you know take your losses, learn from them, and have it be a part of this longer picture as you're fighting. So that's a little uh, brief summary of the book. I'll pass it off. Looking forward to talking with you more. Thank you, Sophia. Next up, we have our um, second graphic novelist. Uh, it is Sean Fitzgibbon. Writer artist Sean Fitzgibbon explores unusual real places and events through his work. He's been teaching college art for almost 20 years, has an MFA in art, and is passionate about art and visual storytelling. He has exhibited work in galleries throughout the US. Graphic nonfiction. What Follows is True, Crescent Hotel, explores the Crescent Hotel's strange two years as the Baker Hospital, one of the darkest and most controversial legends in the town that is Eureka Springs, Arkansas. I can't help but get spooky with the voice. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Philip. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's almost Halloween, so it's like you got to be spooky with it, right? So it's. Um, let's see here. I just advance. Yep. Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> yeah. The, uh, so. Thanks for having me out tonight. I'm just trying to think. So. Um, what I want to do is just kind of discuss, talk a little bit about. My, why I, I what my interest was in this like uh, why the Crescent Hotel and uh, but first I want to kind of uh, mention that I don't know if y'all are aware in 2019 there was this very kind of grim discovery that was made on the grounds of the Crescent Hotel this was in uh, this was are y'all do y'all remember this in 2019 they, they so a landscaper was digging and she the backhoe goes down, comes back up, and these jars came tumbling out. Um, and yeah, this was a very strange discovery. Do you remember that? It happened in 2019. There was a, uh, so you know, they, they look at these jars and they appeared to have what, what appeared to be some sort of human remains of some sort inside these jars. Yeah, and uh, so immediately the whole, this whole area is roped off as a crime scene and these jars were whisked away to state crime labs for analysis, you know? And, uh, <clears throat> and so they did the analysis and they, and they realized that these dated back to the late 1930s and that's whenever it was uh, uh, the uh, Baker Hospital. And along with that, they found uh, medical instruments like bone saw and some things like that along with reels of Norman Baker's uh, uh, feel, uh, advertisements proclaiming his cancer cure along with his cancer cure elixir so anyway so now I want to kind of go back and I'm going to explain a little bit about why this book so I'm originally from southwest Missouri and as a kid I grew up I was uh, my parents would take my sister and I down to Eureka Springs it's like a hundred mile drive so it wasn't bad and uh, you know I was just always so intrigued by the town and uh, anyway, I suppose I should have been doing that the whole time. But anyway, okay, there we are. And uh, if any of you have been to Eureka Springs, it's such an, uh, yeah, it's such an, uh, an amazing town. I was just telling Sophie about that. It's, it's, it's so beautiful. It's, uh, it's the only town in, in America that is on the historic registry. So you're going to get the same thing. <laughs> you're hearing it twice. It's, yeah, and it's, and, uh, it's, it's, uh, none of the roads intersect throughout the town and it's like uh there's no street lights um yeah there's like these little they call it the stair step town in fact the last time i was there i was just there like a couple 
we I was a week ago. I don't know. My my month has been insane because it's October and spooky. And my book's spooky, so I've been so busy. But uh, yeah, there's stairs everywhere. Like, and I last time I was there, I've been there so many times. Every time I find something new, like I found a new set of stairs that I just walked up and I was like, up in this whole section that I never even I I, I wasn't even aware of. And it's like what how. how how I, I did you know it was, and it was so it was and it was this amazing view of the city and it was just like it's amazing so anyway and i'm always just i was intrigued with these queen anne dwellings that are perched high up on these bluffs now see the the town is like uh it's it this limestone and so that's the only real way they were able to build these towns like these these victorian homes up on these bluffs like they're perched almost precariously up on these bluffs Normally they would just like slide down the side of the mountain, but because it's limestone, they're solidly they're, they're it's solid, you know. So it's that's another very <coughs> unusual thing about it, and it's the only, it's it was mentioned as one of the nine most unusual towns by Robert Ripley of Ripley's Believe It or Not. Um, <clears throat> like I said, none of the streets cross at right angles, no stoplights. The layout's completely irregular. Um, yeah, the Basin Park Hotel in Eureka Springs. Uh, an, an interesting little side note is the only hotel like it's like it's seven stories tall but every every level is at ground level so it's like wait what was it and so it's yeah it's basically it's built up against the mountain so each time you get out you're at ground level so just things like that it's it's very interesting but there's also a a sub there's a subterranean portion of the town like there's a city beneath the city in the main part of the, like yeah there's this so it's very very crazy um however as the thing that compelled me the most was the uh the crescent hotel it sits at the highest point of town and it, uh and so i was always and it, we would go on these ghost tours you know and they would always tell about it's very interesting and sometimes very dark history and so you know, I, I, once again, you know, I, I was just very intrigued. And uh, so what about the Crescent Hotel? So just really quick, I'll tell you, the, the Crescent Hotel was built in 1886. There was a, a time where they had a Statue of Liberty in the back, and that shares the same, that's when the Statue of Liberty was erected. And uh, anyway, it's this time that uh, uh, Eureka Springs is becoming this fairly well-known health resort and destination, it's because of the spring waters, the healing springs, and uh, and it was this Arkansas governor, Pal Clayton. He also served as U.S. senator for a while, and he was instrumental in getting that, you know, in in, in making uh, Eureka Springs this tourist destination that we kind of know of today, you know. So he was, uh, if you think about it, like Eureka is right deep in the middle of the Ozarks, and it's very difficult to get there, so. He was able to get the rail to the, you know, so they could get to the, the town itself. Despite its splendor, it was not lucrative. And then in 1934, the Great Depression ended the hotel. It sat empty until 1937 when it reopened as a cancer hospital. And thus beginning the most strange and bizarre chapter in this uh, hotel's history. So going back to when I was a kid, my family and I would go on the tours and I would learn about its history and strange past but what lingered was with me was this this two years that it was this hotel by this fraudulent medical practitioner the story haunted me over the years and so in 2003 i moved to fayetteville to pursue my mfa and all my masters in fine art and then i would visit eureka springs and i'd go on the ghost tours and uh once again they were very very sensational at that time like they didn't really know a whole lot about the actual history because um, there wasn't a whole lot that was readily available. You, you got really, uh, you'd have to really go seek it out, you know. Um, and many of these stories involved uh, liquid cancer cures being poured directly into skulls and hundreds of patients unaccounted for and exorbitant <laughs> amounts of calcium found in the walls. I heard this story like all my life growing up. And so I was like, what really happened? Like that was sort of the catalyst of why, you know, why I did this? I'm like, so what was the real story, you know? Um, Cause people would tell that, that, you know, and I heard this stuff on the ghost tours, you know? So who is Norman Baker and what really happened? So a little skeptical the next day I went to the library, did research and uh, let's see here. I don't know. 
Uh, here, I'm trying to go fast here. I'm going to go. I'm, uh, let's see here. Yeah, so this book, it blends oral histories, old letters, newspaper articles, Norman Baker's vanity biography. Um, I began this project back in 2008. Since then, I've interviewed people all over Norman Baker's hometown of Muscatine, Iowa, and all over Eureka Springs. I did a week-long residency at the Writers Colony at Eureka Springs. I've scoured uh, uh, ar library archives, databases, dug through old newspapers, letters, old photos, court documents, criminal records, microfiche, and I've spent a lot of time exploring cemeteries and locating graves of people found in this book, including Norman Baker's. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> anyway, I would then organize it all into a cohesive narrative. Then I would start drawing. It's my favorite part, drawing, you know. And so uh, that's my cat, Buzz. He's like, he serves as my art director, by the way, <laughs> basically, yeah. So this is kind of my process. I would do a little, you know, scripts, and I would draw rough drafts, like storyboards. And then I kind of tighten up my pencils and then, and then add value. And then I would start adding color on top of that. And I just kind of build it up as I go. And then I would, these are, this is an example of my tight pencils, and then I paint over it, that's tight watercolor, and then I'll light, and then I, the, the only digital is like lighting effects, so I'll go back in digitally with like, to add like lighting effects, things like that. So Photoshop's like my special effects tool, but it's all, but these are all, they're, they're paintings, like you, you know, they're actual on watercolor. And so I interviewed a man, I'm almost done, by the way. So I interviewed a man as a child who ventured into the abandoned hospital hotel in the early 1940s with a friend after Baker's arrest in 1939. So the boys made many strange discoveries that told an even stranger story. Instead of sterile white walls, they found circus-colored interiors and art deco decor amongst forgotten wheelchairs and cancer is, is, cancer is curable posters. Um, in the basement that served as a hospital morgue, they found the same macabre set of jars containing human tissue and so-called cancer cure elixirs that would be buried and unearthed 80 years later. So the boys were both fascinated and horrified by this, their discovery, but with what they failed to realize was this abandoned, built, this abandoned building they entered wasn't really a hospital nor was it a hotel. It was a remnants of an abandoned theater by a sideshow magician whose performance had ended. His cancer uh, elixir was made up of carbolic acid, glycerin, alcohol, and spring water, but his true ingredients was demagoguery and populist rhetoric. Uh, the rhetorics together told a story, a story of the past and predictions of the future, of a charlatan's performance that had been repeated throughout the ages and continues to this day. One that rather than garnish applause as the curtain falls, ends with an empty silence, an empty promise, an empty cure, and an empty structure. So Norman Baker died lonely, those who he met throughout his life either became his devout followers or mortal enemies. Even 60 years after his death, he still divides people. Um, anyway, this is my best interpretation. Uh, yeah, uh, oh yeah, I was gonna say, uh, anyway, yeah, this, this uh, very unique uh, nonfiction graphic novel is my best interpretation of this peculiar person, place and time. Although uh, Baker's been gone for many years now, echoes of his time at uh, Eureka Springs still reverberates, reverberates throughout the Crescent Hotel. So anyway, I'm, I need to kind of speed that up. So that's, that's why I have these notes, because if I don't, I will just keep talking and talking. So anyway, so. <laughs> Thank you both of you for right. presenting your book. Uh, I have a few questions and then I want to open it up so that everybody can uh, kind of ask. Um, I want to start off with Sophia. One of my favorite things about your book is that you take these uh, socialist issues and you give them real world examples like you were talking about uh, having, here's what it looks like for these people to be kind of downtrodden after a while of trying to get the bill passed. Um, it takes a talking point like housing uh, as a human right and breathes life into it. Uh, how do you see this book's relationship to kind of educating people about Salazar but also about the socialist democratic movement and how did you kind of figure out how much you were going to focus on that theme and how much you were going to tell the plot? Yeah. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, when I started the book, I was curious about democratic socialism, but I would certainly not have identified that way and had a fair amount of skepticism about it, both from a political standpoint 
and as far as how much I actually agreed with it, and also, you know, whether it was possible to actually be an effective legislator as the sole socialist. Um, so it's important to me that the, the book communicates that tone, which is that of curiosity and not of like polemic. Like I don't, this is not a book where it's like socialism is good and here is why. This is like, what does it look like when a socialist is elected and has to go actually legislate? Um, so in that way, the actual mechanics of the year had very little to do with the fact that she was a socialist. She was part of the democratic conference in the legislature and that was her unapologetic political philosophy. What that actually meant in practice, which is what I was curious about, was that she didn't take any special interest money, she had zero like corporate dollars, <laughs> um, and that her principles are such that she, for example, would never vote on, she would never vote for a bill that would generate new punitive measures, for example, to incarcerate more people, that kind of thing. Um, but I, I saw it more as, rather than it being a book about that aspect of her, it was more like how does, how does progressive politics work, how does government work, and how is that related to organizing? It became much more about organizing the more time I spent there, um, which I wasn't necessarily expecting, but I'm really happy that that happened because that feels to me like the entry point for folks who aren't, you know, going to be politicians, as I said. Um, so I certainly hope that it's an educative, educating uh, tool, but, but what I love about comics is that, A, it's accessible because of the visual aspect of it, but also it's, it's primarily a story about these people. And um, because I am not a political expert, the thing that I can talk about is the kind of human experience of being in the office and what that felt like and what the emotions were and, um, you know, those are the things I pay attention to, what gestures people made, the things that make them feel human, those are the things that I, you know, just sort of naturally gravitate towards. So I hope that you learn something or gain some insight or are curious about politics from that point, but it's mostly meant to be a story about people. And I think you do such a great job of illustrating these people, pun intended, that you can have, you know, uh, so many different characters all taking place kind of behind Salazar that you don't, you, you otherwise wouldn't get to know about. And that kind of leads to a question for both of y'all. Uh, both of these books have such extensive research into what they are. You can tell that uh, there's so much information. How in the world did you, uh, and if both of y'all can answer this, starting with Sean, uh, how do you pick and choose what goes in and did you have any sort of darlings that kind of were left or that you almost left out how do you how did you pick and choose all of these wonderful antidotes in both books that's interesting yeah that's a good question um i uh so like when i was putting this book together i i mean the it's it's all i i enjoy the process the whole process i, I enjoy the, I actually like interviewing people. I like going out and doing the field work and doing the research, playing, doing the detective work, you know. Um, but there's that point where it's like you've compiled, like, like I had like two of those milk crates, you know, those milk crates like you can buy. Like I had like two of those just full of, of, of research, you know, and it was like, and then it's, then I'm just sitting there looking at it all and I'm like, okay. <laughs> Now, now what do I do? You know, and I'm like, dump it all out on the kitchen table. And it's just like, well, and uh, luckily I, my wife's a librarian. So she, she was good at, she was good at helping me sort of organize all this. So what we did is we organized it chronologically and we basically had Norman Baker's life story chronologically, you know, organized. And, and then we also organized uh, the uh, Crescent Hotel chronologically for, like, from you know, the, when it was built up to the present. And, uh, and so, and, and then, well, Baker's life is so complicated. It's like, we, there's all these different, you know, well, once you, you know, once you organize like that, you, you get all these different categories, like all these different chapters throughout his life. So we have them all, you know, organized like that. And there's so many chapters that are so interesting that like, honestly, this could be like an HBO series, you know, like you, and, and every series has its own tone and its own texture. 
it's like the, the Muscatine years, like well, early the early years, he was a vaudeville magi vaudeville like a mentalist magician, you know, and uh, like that's a whole chapter, like that's a whole segment of this guy's life, and I and I would learn about that, and I'm like, oh man, I want to really. I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie Nightmare Alley that recently came. It's actually a, a remake of an earlier noir about, you know, that's really good. And um, and I wanted to like, oh, I love that kind of stuff. And it, and he's this, you know, con artist, basically. So basically, Baker took his, what he learned as a vaudeville magician, and then sleight of hand and all that, and extended that throughout his entire career, you know, for moving forward. And... Uh, uh, and each of these chapters of his life is just so fascinating. And same with the Crescent Hotel. Like, like, uh, so I actually have a show coming up next next week at the at the Eureka Springs Historical Museum, and I'm going to have some of my original pages, and they're going to have artifacts from when it was the Baker Hospital. And uh, the person before me has a. Uh, she has a show right now, and she's done extensive research on the, so just before, okay, so before, after the Crescent Hotel was built, you know, it was this luxurious hotel, like I said, um, it fell on hard times fairly quickly, like they had a hard time sustaining it, because it is in the middle of the Ozarks, you know, and it's hard to get there, and so to supplement lagging winter hours in the, uh, in the, you know, the, during the winter, it, they, they opened it up as a girls' school. As a, it was called the Crescent Conservatory, Crescent Conservatory for Young Women, and uh, and so it was it was that during the and that it was that until like 1908 till like 19 early 30s, and uh, basically the Great Depression ended both the hotel and the girls' school, and uh, that's when Norma Baker comes along. But that girls' school. There's a show right now, and, and a woman is doing, I know her, but she's doing a book about that whole period, because that's a big period, you know? And it's not as, dark, not as dark at all, you know? It's a good period. And so I'm like, oh, that's nice. I'm happy there's this nice moment, you know? And so... Um, is that all in the book? Well, no, that's what I'm saying, Newt, yeah. because my book's not really about... I talk a little bit about the when it was the girls' school, Crescent Conservatory, um, and but... Uh, like that kind of thing. I'm just sitting there. I would have loved to have learned more about that. And it's like, because you get, you go into these rabbit holes that just, you can go so deep into this stuff. And there's moments where you have to just like, because it's nonfiction, you have to just say, okay, I'm, I got to stop right here. Because you're, you're talking about someone's life. Like it's so, like, so extensive, you know? And it's like, yeah. You know, and, and so you really do have to pick and choose. Am I am I answering this right? Yeah, you, you're great. I, I hope. <laughs> I hope. Hey, Robert, it's good seeing you. I uh, and I'm. I I hope. I tell, I just go on. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Robert knows. He was at. We were at a talk a thing a few weeks ago, and I just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do. I think what, what feels similar is you it's so extensive. Like initially you're like, oh nonfiction, great, I don't have to come up with anything. It's easier than fiction. And then oh. you're like, oh my god, so much and it's all about editing and that is really overwhelming. For me I had like, you know, fourteen people I was following and then also the organizers and all the legislation happening and so the organizing principle as far as making decisions about what went in and what stayed out was does it, does it follow an emotional arc? Does the story have a narrative that people want to follow? Um, so I tried as much as possible to, to have the legislation in there to the extent that it was relevant to the people and to the you know, emotional core of the book. Um, but there was so much that was interesting, like you were saying, there's so much that like really piques your interest as you're there or that like was really meaningful or you spent a ton of time with. Um, for me, I spent a ton of time with the, the district organizers doing all this really interesting stuff in North Williamsburg and, and in Williamsburg and North Brooklyn, and I really wanted to showcase it, but it just didn't fit into this narrative that even with all the cuts is, you know, over 300 pages. So if it didn't have like an emotional component to it that was really obvious, then it, it probably ended up on the cutting room floor for me. And I, I see that with like characters like Boris, uh, there's kind of this through line of, well, when is he going to grow up a little bit? Yeah, and you know, when is he going to recognize, you know, 
maybe this isn't the best way to interact in politics. And, uh, I want uh, to have, I have many other questions, but I want to be able to open it up to the audience if you have any questions now uh, about either works. Yes. Oh, and, thanks. Um, I, I, it's, I mean, I know you've worked on Sit Down this, but were you thinking of looking at making like old sepia tone because it was in the past? Or, um, yeah, no, that's a great question. Or, yeah, observation. Um, so, actually, I, I deliberately, I'm glad you, you mentioned that because I deliberately sort of color coded. Like, my, so these, okay, so there's three different t primary or major timelines throughout. So, there's like, I say the present, but when I was working on this back in like 2008 or whatever, but uh, so there's the the contemporary times, and that has this overall sort of greenish tone, and then I sort of complement that with because Baker was he was obsessed with the color purple, like he was, which is kind of brilliant in a way because purple is a soothing color, and so he kind of and I think and royal, oh, yeah, exactly, it's he's fancy, you know, so um, and so during Baker's tenure at the Crescent Hotel, like that has this overall sort of purplish tonality. And then when you go back to like the early days of like with his vaudeville and like with his days in Muscatine, as well as like the early days of the Crescent, it does have that overall sepia tone. So, and I did that so it's like that way, because I do bounce around through time so much in the book, I want to keep you on track. So you're not just like, well, where am I now? You know, because, I love doing this sort of thing. If you notice, I, I, I love architecture, I love space, I love telling, you know, putting characters within an actual space. And so I love uh, drawing, like you're going through different, like, like say the, the Crescent Hotel in the present and then going back and you're seeing it in different, you know, as it was in disarray, like as it's in an abandoned, you know, in, you know, after it was abandoned, and then you're seeing it when Baker was there. And so you, you see many of these same rooms and locations, but they look drastically different, you know? And so I, I do that, so it's like, I, I want people to like go back and be like, oh, I, I think I remember seeing that. And it's like, and you see it in all these different stages, you know? And so you can actually kind of identify it, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, so that's a great, I'm glad you noticed that. I'm glad you kind of picked up on that. So, thank you. Yes. Uh, Sophia, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Sean talks about how he used Photoshop for like that lighting effect. In your work, how much was digital? How much was traditional? Like, why did you pick that? Yeah, it's it's all drawn digitally. Um, I drew it on in Photoshop on a tablet, so it looked like a you know stylus. Um, Primarily that was because of time constraints. It's a lot faster to edit in that format. Are you an artist? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so the digital work, it kind of you know clears a path for you to be able to edit pretty quickly if you draw a straight mark or something. Um, and it took two years to do the, the writing and the drawing, but that was a pretty, which is nothing compared to this book <laughs> by Sean, but it, it, it meant that for, it felt pretty quick, um, especially towards the end, so. All digital. Yeah. The question is a filmmaker and artist myself. <clears throat> what you did, Sophia, was pretty much just a documentary in drawing. How did you, in my mind, I'd like to think you're there with a sketchbook drawing, you know, pre sketching, yeah, or were you taking pictures, or how did you? Yeah, I did both. I have a ton of sketchbooks. Um, I was kind of hoping I would be able to figure out a way to do like an appendix with some of those. I couldn't do it because it was already very long. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was drawing just you know pen and paper and taking notes mostly. Um, and then I would also uh, record, so I recorded meetings and had those transcripts. Um, did a lot of video and photo for reference. Google Maps, like the Street View, very helpful. How did you? How do you? How did you organize this? But he used milk crates. I know. I wish I had a librarian wife to help me out. I've got to do that for the next one. Um, it was, Note to self. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was pretty. It was pretty piecemeal. Honestly, it was not not my favorite part. Was organizing that stuff. I tried to keep a log. So I had like a the the primary document that I was working from was that I would do like a running. Uh, daily notes, so at the end of every day, I would kind of write everything up in one document, and then from there, I would, you know, link to my um, 
either my recordings or uh, video, whatever it was, like a photo uh, folder. Um, but I'm sure if anyone were to like take a look at it, they would be horrified by the organizing structure. <laughs> I think with how extensive both of y'all's research was, you it really comes through with how nuanced the writing is. And I, I wanted to quote a section and ask you about it, Sophia. Um, this is uh, on page 117, so you're kind of deep into it. And I think we can all kind of relate to this when we think about politics. Um, the cynic in me said, come on, Albany is corrupt and politics is slimy and all the sentiment it will get watered down to nothing by the time the bills are signed. But this was the most diverse and most progressive chamber in its history that had to mean something, right? After going through this experience and spending time with uh, Salazar and people uh, who work for her, uh, do you still hold on to that sense of it meaning something? Yeah, I do. Um, when I started this project, I was like so disillusioned and frustrated and had just like absolutely no faith in governmental structures. I think that's not <coughs> a unique feeling to me. That was certainly, you know, the prevailing attitude of most of the people I knew that why should we trust this? It's not working for us. Um, and it's not that I've lost that sense of skepticism. I think we need it and that's the hallmark of a democracy that's working, but it was, it really, gave me a lot of hope and I found it really inspiring to, to follow this group of truly well-meaning people. And I mean that, meaning this office, but also, you know, there's so many people working in government. It's a huge aspect of, of labor in the US and so much of what is happening is in good faith and by people who mean well and are working really hard and are sincere about it. Um, and those systems, like we have to invest in them for them to work. If we don't believe in them, they won't work and they will be, you know, he's speaking of demagogues, like it's easy for them to be hijacked. So I think it, it, it is inspiring and it also like brought home the, the fact that it's, you know, we have to pay attention to it as citizens. Like you can't just expect it to work and then, or just be frustrated when it doesn't. It's like, you have to buy in with your attention and, and that we can get something out of it. So it's kind of weird for me to like, feel like I'm doing this tour of like raw, raw government, because I'm, I'm not, I'm still like, oh God, government is so scary. Um, but it was, I, I at least feel like I have some sense of what it can do and why it's worth not just like throwing in the towel on it, so. Do you guys see yourself doing a follow up it's always a milk crate. It's always, yeah. 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 With the political stuff you can follow up later, however it goes. Do you guys see yourself doing that? Or? Do you? Oh, yeah. I do. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. The, well, the what follows is true. That That's like the umbrella. That's my new, yeah, yeah I'm doing a series of those, actually. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So it's the beginning. So, and I'm already, yep, already, well, started. So I'm the next, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think time will tell. I'm not sure yet. I don't think I'm going to follow another politician. That feels like I could kind of only do it once because the whole conceit of the book was like, I don't know how government works. <laughs> so <laughs> not that I don't. I'm sure it would be still surprising to follow someone else, but I think maybe the moment has passed for me. Um, but I do really love, like, it's one of my favorite things about the medium is that it gives me this this option of, like, spending time in spaces that I wouldn't otherwise. I have this kind of like excuse, <laughs> which is like, oh, I'm drawing it. Um, so I, I definitely want to do that as my life goes on. I don't know what form that will take, whether it'll be a book or like shorter pieces. Um, we'll totally see. It totally makes sense for you to run for senator and then make another thing. What's that? I said it totally makes sense to run for a senator and, and write that. I know, people keep asking me if I'm going to run, for sure That's not. Happening. My mom wants me to run for dog catcher, so <laughs> we'll see. It's not a job I want, but she's insisted. Uh, both books have a lot of um, kind of points uh, that you immediately want to 
do as much research on and say, well, I want to know more about that. I need to know more about this. It becomes very engaging. And Sean, one of the things that you end a chapter with and it drops off and I say, no, no, I need to know. No. Um, every year, purple flowers are mysteriously still placed at Norman Baker's grave. And yeah. What? <laughs> that's kind of yeah. I, I I don't know. I mean, that's that. I I even asked him at the cemetery. I was like, yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, like when he after Baker died, like his uh, his Mark gravestone was destroyed. Like right, like someone destroyed it, and then and uh, and then it was later replaced, and then someone put purple flowers down by his grave. So that that's very enigmatic of like who that that pretty much tells you like how divisive Norm Baker is to, to this day. Like I've interviewed so many people that you know, both sides on Baker, you know, that are like, no, he's he was he he's he's a healer. He's, you know, oh, the placebo effect. He's you know, this kind of, and then there's people, you know, and then which I'm I mean no, I don't think so. But I mean, he was making money, is what he was doing. He was he was making money off desperate people, and it was chicanery and it was lies. That's what it, what's what it was. But there's some people that would just you know um, don't don't see it that way. And so, but I've interviewed both, you know, and uh, yeah, I I, I don't I, and I kind of like that that mystery of that because I and I saw him there. I saw when I was there, there were purple flowers at his grave, and I, I have no idea. And they didn't know either. They're like, yeah, they just show up every year. There's <laughs> these purple flowers, and they they said that's been since he died in 1958. It's been every year since then. Like, and then I mean, first it was destroyed, and then they and then they laid, laid the flowers. But it's interesting. At one point. Um, if you notice at his his gravestone is him and Irma. Irma Beg the Irma was his sister. He was the youngest of ten, and out of all his t all his ten siblings, she was the only one that would speak to Norman Baker when he died. Actually, and uh, it is interesting though. I mean, so I, I think the I think it's heavier weighted on the side, thankfully, of the people that do think of him as this populist demagogue. But um, uh, yeah, one point like. He, he would give the, like at his radio station, he had this radio station, you know, and, and he would put, do these big shows and he'd have bands and do all this stuff and have it. And then he would do his like medicine show, cancer shows and all that kind of stuff, very sensational. Thousands of people would, would show up for these things, you know, and it was, it was crazy. Like, um, and, uh, but then, you know, the years go on, and then by the time you know he 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 died in he died in 1958, he was 75, but he had like cirrhosis, and uh, he was in Florida. He lived out his days after the Crescent Hotel, basically in Florida, and he was living on a yacht in in Florida, and uh, and and then by the time they they bring his body back and they buried him in Muscatine, they had to hire pallbearers from the local community mm -hmm. college. To, to to you know so it's like it's interesting to think at one time that and that is like maybe not far from where at one time he attracted thousands I mean tens of thousands of people people had come from all over the Midwest to this and then there were like five people at his funeral you know and they had to hire people to, to carry the cop so anyway that's <laughs> kind of I kind of went over again on yeah, that. <laughs> To speak of the kind of documentarian portion of this, yeah. uh, both of you uh, put yourselves within the narrative. You often see both of them talking yeah. to the person rather than this assumed objective experience. How uh, how was that choice made? Was that choice made very early on? Um, yeah, initially I didn't want to be in it um, because I, I just didn't think the story should be about me. Um, but as I was shaping the narrative, it pretty quickly felt like it would be dishonest. And um, just because I was the one experiencing it and I have all my biases and uh, you know blind spots and all that stuff. But also it became, because there are so many, because I didn't want to centralize the story on just Julia's experience, I didn't want to like write a biography of her, it meant that I had this sort of like disparate cast um, 
And so in order to feel like there is an emotional center to the book, I felt like actually my character makes the most sense to hold that place because it was a very, as I said, meaningful experience for me. Um, and so the through line in the narrative is that I was the one experiencing it and you know asking the questions. So I think that just from a like zooming out of it, <laughs> like from a constructing the narrative standpoint, um, it made a lot of sense for that character to be there. And it also, I get to be this sort of like audience surrogate where I'm the one asking the dumb questions so that we can all learn about this thing. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. Thank you for that, because every question you ask in the book, I'm like, well, I wanted to know that. You know. Uh, same question, Sean. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the surrogate thing. That's really kind of how I felt with my, I don't, I, I don't actually say anything in the book. I'm really just kind of a cipher for the, you know, it's like, I'm just sort of like, because I'm interviewing people. Like, I, that's why I even put myself in there, really. It's just, uh, uh, because I, I want, I want there, I want, it's all, my book's all like oral, uh, well, a lot of it's oral histories, you know, and, uh, and, and so I just want to hear what they had to say. And so I'm, and I, since I did interview them, I think that's part of the interesting aspect is that I was just, a, so I'm really not, I, I more or less just let them answer the question. You know, I don't really sit there and ask the question. They're just telling me, you know, and so, I mean, I did ask them the questions, but you, as you read it, I think it, you know, you kind of figure out what I was asking them. So, um, yeah, I, I'm the same way. I didn't even really want to put me in the book. I just wanted, uh, you know, so, uh, because I just want to tell the story. So I'm more a device, you know, to kind of get you into that, you know, uh, they kind of take you back to that particular time and place, you know. Because I, I interviewed one guy that uh, he was, he was 94 when I, when, I, when I interviewed him. And that I've worked on this for so long. He passed away uh, just recently. He was 104, and that was 10 years ago. And so, um, and uh, yeah, and he, but he, he'd been around so long that, he was like 20 when Baker was in the 30s, yeah, and he was, so he saw Baker all the time, you know, in fact, he was a, uh, uh, he was an engineer, and uh, he would work on radios and all that kind of stuff, and so, uh, anyway, yeah, he was very, you know, he, he ride around on his, it was an Indian motorcycle from the 1930s, you know, and he would, and, I have him in the book, and he's in the book. His name's Mac Weems, and, and that was a really, it's fascinating, you know, and I get to, it was just fascinating to, to, to interview these people that were like this, like Mac was like this bridge to the past, you know, and it was just so great to be able to interview those people, you know, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that's an interesting, that's a good question. Well, I want to give a round of applause for our speakers, our authors, our novelists, our artists. Uh, I'm going to ask for y'all to go ahead and move there while I'm finishing up the conclusions. Oh, it's just an easier little sign of thing. Um, 